Welcome. Welcome to um, the last lecture on uh, palypidology, taking an historical view of the development of soils and life uh, through time. Um, last time we talked about the origin of trees, uh, a biological invention that changed the world. And it changed the world through the invention of different kinds of forest soils seen for the first time on Earth. Uh, particularly alpha soles, but also alta soles um, and uh, spodosols and histosols, really thick um, histosols. Um, by the Permian, um, we had um, all of these kinds of soils um, in considerable diversity. Um, the only one that was missing of the modern 12 soil orders uh, were mollusols. Remarkably, mollusols did not turn up until around about 20 million years ago. Um, they were the last um, holdout uh, and a biological creation of grasslands, of um, grasses and of grazers, a coevolutionary process, which was another big step um, in the evolution of uh, life and uh, climate, a cooling step uh, by the Proserpina principle, which I've talked about before. Uh, what was it about grasses that made them so um, amazing um, and uh, transformative uh, to um, the planet? Uh, it's kind of interesting to think of grasses as, as, like, um, as like computers. Um, that doesn't seem like a big deal um, when they first came out. Um, the IBM um, 1519 that I worked on as a student in 1970 was um, in a couple of rooms at the university administered by guys with um, uh, white shirts and um, pen holders in their pockets. Um, it didn't seem like it was all that relevant, but these small inventions um, have big ramifications once they start uh, spreading out. Uh, so grasses are important um, because they have a number of really um, unique um, adaptations. Let's consider, for example, festuca or uh, fescue. Um, a common uh, pasture grass in our area, Festuca idahoensis, is probably um, one of the main um, grasses that we have in our lawns here. Um, and it is a um, interesting grass. Um, uh, it's a flowering plant, but the flowering plant has a spike. Um, each of these little things here in the spike, the tassel, uh, tassels like this are finding their way into floral arrangements, not like um, the normal sorts of showy blossoms we find uh, at the florist. It's got a tiny little flower. That tiny little flower has a carpel. Uh, the carpel has a feathery stigma. Um, inside there is an ovule. This is the carpel of the flower. These carpels are arranged along the axis of the spike, like so. Um, there's no petals, no sepals. There's just a pair of bracts, both behind and in front. This is a feathery stigma, um, which is the receptive surface for the pollen grains. And the pollen grains are produced by anthers, which um, droop out of uh, the bottom of uh, the carpel. So they're, they're perfect flowers in, 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 in the botanical meaning that they have both male and female parts in the same structure. Uh, but very different from a rose or a magnolia or an orchid, uh, not really designed uh, for uh, elegant uh, pollination. Um, these are plants that are uh, definitely are selected. Or weedy. Um, they are adapted uh, to having quick reproduction. Um, the uh, method of reproduction is not fancy. Um, the uh, pollen grains are dispersed on the wind around about now. A lot of people in Eugene um, would be wearing masks, not because of the COVID pandemic, but uh, because of the pollen um, in the air. Uh, they produce great clouds of pollen that blanket the whole of uh, Eugene uh, and uh, misery for allergy uh, sufferers. Um, and a few of those will actually get caught up on a feathery stigma and then uh, fertilize uh, the carpel. 
um, the R selected strategy um, relies upon the growth phase um, of a population. The idea is to produce so many offspring that even if only a few of them make it, most of them die, 99.9% .9 of them die. If a few survive, then that is um, success for uh, the species. These are adapted, of course, to disturbed sites, to vacant lots, to um, road cuts, to quarries, and in nature, to areas that are prone to flooding or landslides or marine um, erosion. Um, a very distinctive kind of a life cycle uh, for, a, um, for a plant. So it's an early successional plant that is adapted to filling in the empty spaces in the landscape. It's also a plant that is unique in forming a, um, a carpet. Um, grasses have a structure where they have a rhizome. Um, that has uh, nodes, and at the nodes there are bunches of leaves, uh, and there are adventitious roots. They are adventitious roots because um, the rhizome is actually an underground stem. The land surface is here. Um, what this um, does is it uh, enables grasses to make a carpet an actual sod that you can roll up and replant. Um, there are a few alpine plants that produce carpets and cushions like this, but grasses are the premier carpet forming plants um, of um, the natural um, world. Um, this has the effect of um, really protecting the land surface, protecting the soil from drying out and from blowing away. It's a very effective barrier uh, between the forces of destruction in nature uh, and um, the soil uh, itself. It has another um, advantage too in that the leaves are produced above the, above the ground and they can be eaten but th that would be no detriment to the rest of the plant which is largely underground. Uh, this rhizome can produce more leaves uh, from itself. Um, they are in a sense um, adapted to being eaten or grazed uh, by, uh, by animals. Grasses also have a very interesting structure um, at, the, um, at the nodes. Here's the node of a comb. Here's the comb or stem of the grass. This is called a leaf sheath. Um, this is the leaf itself. Um, this is a node, which is uh, where the uh, leaf uh, grows from. Uh, and the leaf sheath itself has an intercalary meristem. A remarkable structure uh, by which the plant can still produce more leaf even if this part is eaten, taken off, um, eaten by a cow. Um, it can still produce more leaf and elongate in this way. Um, it seems as if uh, also when grasses are eaten, they grow faster. Uh, something I discovered as a teenage boy when I had the task of uh, mowing our uh, suburban, um, suburban lawn. If you look at the top of a grass uh, at a bunch of these leaves, you'll see there's one leaf here, another leaf here, another leaf here, another leaf. Where's, where are they coming from? Well, they're coming all the way down um, from the base of that cluster of leaves where you have a terminal meristem that produces the leaf buds. This is a um, telescoped terminal meristem. The meristem um, is the totipotent cells that can make any kind of cell. Um, and this is where the leaves actually start to grow. Um, this um, terminal meristem, where the leaf buds begin as baby leaves and then grow up, uh, can be eaten in its entirety, taken off, and yet still produce more leaves. It's a very interesting structure. Um, quite different from the structure that you get in other sorts of plants. In other sorts of plants, for example, where you have a leaf that is like this, um, and a terminal meristem, which is here, 
Um, the, this is the, um, the lateral meristem here. And here is the terminal meristem. The leaf unfurls uh, with a lateral meristem. If you eat that, that's the end of that leaf. If you take out this terminal meristem, it's gone. The grasses still have a meristem um, below uh, by which they can continue uh, to grow. And then finally, um, grasses produce in their cells silica phytoliths. Um, these are opaline bodies uh, of opal. S I O two N H two O, um, and they're quite uh, prickly-looking structures. Some of the most common ones are like dumbbells. Um, they're kind of like hollow dumbbells, hollowed-out structures. Um, you can get uh, ones that are uh, trifoliate, like a clover uh, leaf. You can get um, silica bodies that are uh, like a coxcomb. Um, and um, these are all rather small, about 30 microns or so um, in size. Uh, plants excrete this opal, which is basically glass, on the outside of their leaves. Grasses do this especially well, um, particularly the older parts of the grass leaf have a lot of this material. Uh, this gives the leaf the texture of sandpaper uh, and makes it resistant uh, to being eaten. So while grasses can accommodate a certain amount of abuse, they're also fighting back uh, by putting uh, silica uh, phytoliths um, on the surface of the leaf and also um, in um, the uh, individual cells that are in the exterior of, um, of the leaf. Now, um, we can um, look at the fossil record of grasses from megafossils to see these various features, the telescoped endonodes, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the sheathing leaves, um, and the phytoliths themselves. We can separate out the phytoliths. Um, and this gives us an idea of when grasses started to become more and more prominent, because grass phytoliths, um, with those dumbbell and trifoliate and coxcomb shapes, are quite distinct from the sort of blocky polyhedral phytoliths that you get in other sorts of plants. So there's a fossil record of this uh, kind of thing. Um, which has been examined in some detail to look at the origin of grasslands. Uh, but um, the main line of evidence for the origin of grasslands for some time, um, ever since Kovaleski, who was a contemporary of Darwin, um, has been mammals. Mammals also adapted to uh, grasses in fairly uh, characteristic um, ways. Um, we're talking now about evolution of mammals since uh, the demise of the dinosaurs. There were mammals that associated with the dinosaurs, but they were a minor part of the ecosystem. Um, those mammals um, in the age of the dinosaurs were tiny uh, shrew-like creatures, and their molar teeth were um, like this, the teeth of an insectivore. Um, like a mole or a shrew. Uh, small creatures um, with um, the teeth, the cheek teeth, having uh, quite high uh, crowned uh, cusps, these sharp cusps. This is ideal if you're an insectivore because you need to have a puncturing organ uh, to get through the hard carapace of the insect and suck out those nutritious uh, juices. It didn't take long um, in the evolution of mammals in the early tertiary for teeth to start to shape up as grinding platforms. Um, for um, eating um, forage or eating uh, plants. Um, this is uh, the tooth of a browser. Um, an example would be an oreodon, which is an extinct kind of an animal um, found particularly in Oligocene age rocks um, in uh, the United uh, States. Um, another example would be a rhino, rhinoceros. 
Um, these are browsing um, animals um, that have relatively low crown teeth. Um, they have an enamel, a hard outer coat, which is shiny. And then they have dentine, which is the soft inner tissue, which is exposed um, where the enamel is worn away. Um, and this makes a unique grinding uh, surface because the enamel always stands up above the dentine uh, to create a slight irregularity like a rasp. And as you, um, as you wind your way down through um, this, um, this material, um, you get a flat grinding surface. That's what you need if you're a vegetarian. Vegetarians um, have to eat a lot more than carnivores uh, because there's not that much energy in plants. Uh, this kind of tooth was very widespread in the Oligocene um, and even in the Eocene. By the time we get to the Miocene, we start to find these big uh, prismatic teeth um, without um, constant roots. Um, with this infolded dentine and enamel pattern um, in a surface. Uh, whereas the browser tooth is low crowned, this is what we call brachydont. Uh, these teeth are high crowned, what we call hypsodont. Very high crowned above um, above the crown. This is the tooth of a grazer. This is this example I've sketched here is a horse tooth. Uh, but um, other grazers are bison. Um, horses are um, what we call chrysodactyls or um, odd toed uh, creatures. Um, uh, bison are even toed or artiodactyls, cloven hoof creatures. Uh, they both have these very high teeth. Um, with a very complicated enamel dentine juncture, um, which is adapted uh, for triturating very coarsely abrasive material like grass with a lot of phytoliths um, in it. Um, we, when we start to see these in abundance, we know we've got grasslands appearing. And there certainly are a lot of these around um, by about 5 million years ago. And you can sort of see an inkling of it uh, starting at around about 20. Uh, million years ago is when things start to sort of move from brachydont, uh, low crown, through to um, hypsodont. But the limbs of mammals also changed as well. So the archaic pattern for mammals is the pattern um, that we see um, in um, us uh, and in dogs and cats. Um, where let's just take the forelimb. This is a scapulum. Uh, this is a humerus. This is the radius, an ulna. Um, there's some um, bones that are um, of the wrist, wrist bones. Um, there are these bones in the flat of the hand. Those are what we call um, carpals. Um, and then there's phalanges, and then there's claws. Uh, five fingers, five toes. Um, this is um, what we call uh, a doggy style uh, kind of generalized um, locomotory uh, system that we find in um, early mammals. And it's familiar to us because we have the same sort of doggy style uh, limb structure, although we walk erect. And this is, uh, the same thing occurs in the hind limb. Um, it, the, 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 the femur articulates into the pelvis, um, and there's a tibia and fibia. And then there's a flat of the um, of the um, a flat of the foot, uh, which is the tarsal um, in the in 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 the real limb. Now, as we see grasses starting to come into the picture, then uh, this whole system starts to get redesigned. You have a scapula still, um, but the um, humerus uh, becomes a bone which is up against the body. Um, the ulna and radius start to uh, develop into a mid limb. Then there's a bone of the wrist, which is the astragalus. Um, and then there's another bone down in here. This is a metacarpal. Uh, a metatarsal in the rear limb. Uh, and then there's a few bones and then there's a hoof. This is the structure, of course, of a horse limb. 
Um, this is a generalized structure. This is a structure which is regarded as cursorial. What's happened is the number of digits in the in, in the both for limb and the hind limb has been reduced to one, uh, two in the bison lineage uh, from the original four. But this metacarpal, uh, also called the cannon bone or the metatarsal of the rear limb, is now a major limb bone um, of the, about the same length as the um, ulnar and radius and the humerus. You've extended the limb uh, tremendously. You've extended the lever arm. Um, this has given um, these creatures a increased ability to run away. Um, they are uh, cursorial creatures of open country. Uh, when you go from uh, woodland, uh, where you can hide and climb and sneak around uh, with this kind of a limb structure to an open grassland, um, the only um, way of escaping uh, from predators um, is to um, actually um, run away. Um, this is a um, rather um, remarkable line of evidence for um, uh, grasslands as well. Uh, this kind of cursorial limb structure really starts to turn up around about 20 million years ago um, as well, and it becomes quite extreme by the time we get to about 5 uh, million years uh, before, before present. Um, so we have this idea of grasslands appearing around about 20 million um, years ago. What are the paleosols saying? Well, paleosols give us about the same story. Uh, we see um, mollusol. A brand new kind of soil, never seen before um, in the world. And I'll go over them once again. Um, a mollusol, um, of course, is a kind of a profile um, that has a uh, structure uh, which is um, has a, uh, a surface horizon um, which is very uh, clay. And you go down into silty material. Uh, it can have a uh, calcareous horizon. It can also have gypsic horizon. So this would be an A. This would be a BK. This is an optional horizon. Uh, this is a BY, another optional horizon. So this is organic plus mineral. Uh, this is a calcareous nodules. Uh, you get these in dry mollusols, but it's not necessary for a mollusol. Um, this is um, gypsum crystals. Uh, this would be found in the drier range again. Um, and if it's in the same profile, it's always lower in the same profile. Uh, but the thing about this A horizon is that it is a molic epipedon. Uh, greater than 18 centimeters. Um, in thickness. Um, I don't know why they decided on this, but they did. Um, you have to have a certain thickness of a mollic epipedon for it to qualify as a mollusol, and that is the only diagnostic horizon of this, of this profile. The mollic epipedon is rich in organic matter. Um, about 10% or so, 10 weight percent of organic matter. So it's normally a kind of a dark browny color. Um, that doesn't always hang around in a paleosol because if a paleosol is buried um, above the water table, that organic matter can be carried away uh, by microbes. Uh, but um, it has a very fine crumb um, structure. Uh, and this, I think, is the most diagnostic feature of a mollic epipedon. Um, if we look at the crumbs themselves, um, they are uh, smectite, clay. A very fertile uh, clay, rich in uh, nutrients, with organic rims. Um, these organic rims are produced by um, earthworms, of course, uh, and other uh, soil fauna. Uh, much of this crumb structure is actually the fecal pellets of uh, soil fauna, particularly Earthworms. Charles Darwin was very keen on this and wrote a book on the subject um, on the um, formation of soil by worms. Um, and vermiculture, of course, is still a big thing 
uh, in creating fertile uh, soil material. Um, the organisms also come from the exudates of roots uh, because we're talking about grasses now and grasses don't have big thick tap roots uh, that are very woody. Uh, grasses have these fine millimetric size um, finely branching um, roots that divide the soil up in this fashion um, and create a kind of a crumb structure as well uh, from the exudates of um, the root um, the root itself. The smectite clay is very fertile. It's rich in nutrients. Um, they are, of course, magnesium, uh, calcium, sodium, and potassium, which means that it's a very fertile soil. So in the molecapipedon is one of the most prized soils for farming because it is um, rich in nutrients and it is stable. If this uh, smectite soil were not bound up in these organic rimmed crumb heads, it would be a vertisol. It would be one of those unstable shrink swell soils that develops these really um, unfortunate uh, structural uh, characteristics, which makes it very, very um, difficult uh, for um, uh, highways or houses or anything to maintain a stable, a stable footing. Um, there are parts of, uh, of Texas where we have these vertisol soils where it's very hard to keep buildings and roads uh, from just cracking with the shrink swell behavior uh, between, uh, between storms. Molosols on the other um, hand are quite stable even for heavy agricultural um, equipment. Um, you can drive over them um, and you can uh, quite easily raise a crop in them because they're very very fertile. A brand new invention um, created by the carpet of grasses on um, the landscape. Now, um, this is a fantastic, I think, example of um, what uh, is a general principle of uh, co-evolution. Co-evolution um, is the coordinated evolution of two unrelated kinds of organisms. In this case, we're talking about grasses and grazers to produce something totally new and different. In this case, the Moloch Epipedon, a new invention for the world. Really quite a remarkable uh, invention. Um, other examples of coevolution are bees and blossoms, um, the way in which specific pollinators um, have created a tremendous diversity of um, bee pollinated uh, plants uh, because bees are social and smart enough to return to the same plant. They create a sort of a isolation, uh, genetic isolation of the plants that enables them uh, to um, create uh, this unique uh, kind of evolutionary uh, coupling. Uh, in grasses and grazers, uh, the consequences were quite um, a bit more uh, profound. Um, rolling out this new carpet on the landscape because of the um, action of um, grasses producing um, a lot of underground biomass, rhizomes and adventitious roots, um, and producing a carpet, uh, which of course keeps the um, uh, underground soil moist and does not drying out and, and not eroding. Um, the, um, the, the, the grazers forcing the grasses to do that by busily chomping um, everything that is above ground so that the grasses are investing more in putting uh, organic carbon back in uh, to um, the soil. Um, Coevolution is important um, because uh, it is not like ordinary evolution. We, we tend to think of um, evolution as a process whereby creatures are adapted to their environment. Coevolution is not like that. The grasses and grazers are not adapting to their environment. They're adapting to each other. Uh, it reminds me of uh, fraternity parties where um, the fraternity boys and the sorority girls are together and they're interested in each other, but they don't care about their environment. They leave their, uh, their house completely trashed with red, um, with red cups and other um, waste. Their concerns are elsewhere. It's the same with grasses and grazers. Since they're so concerned about each other, because their livelihood depends on it, they have the t potential to change the environment. And what I want to do now 
is to make a case that the grasses and grazers together, their coevolutionary coupling changed the world. In fact, it cooled the world. It cooled the world uh, over um, about 20 million years uh, since this um, whole um, enterprise uh, basically began. Uh, you've probably seen uh, these curves of the oxygen isotopic composition of forams in the sea, which is taken as a, uh, this is in per mil, which is in per thousand, zero, this is plus two. Um, we commonly reverse the axis because it looks a little bit better that way. Um, and if we go from, say, 50 million years ago through to the present, this is million years before uh, present, uh, if we analyze this isotopic composition, um, we find uh, that there was a kind of a very low value about 50 million years ago. Um, and then it went very low again at about um, 37 or so. Uh, and then it started ramping down. There was another spike short-lived at about 16. Um, it ramped uh, down uh, continuously. Um, and this is uh, taken as an index of um, global um, temperature. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the temperature declining um, over time until right here we have an ice age. No clear glaciers in the world for um, the earlier part of this sequence, but then an ice age down here. A brief um, reversal of the trend in the middle Miocene. Sixteen million years ago. Um, which was probably due to the eruption of large-scale uh, volcanic um, basalts, um, such as the Columbia um, River um, basalt. Could the coevolution of grasses and grazers have created uh, this global uh, cooling? Well, um, I think uh, a good case uh, can uh, be made. How do they do it exactly? Well, they do it um, first off by um, burying carbon. The mollusol has 10 weight percent or so organic carbon in its surface horizon. Um, and um, these mollusols in some parts of the world, like near Joliet, Illinois, can be a meter thick. Uh, to be a mollusol, it has to be at least 18 centimeters thick. Um, these have the most carbon of any soil order other than histosols, other than the peaty swamp soils. The current land area of histosols in the world is about 3%. The current land area of mollusols is about 25%. There's a lot more mollusol in the world than there is histosol. Um, in the evolution of this ecosystem, it started out in small areas around about 20 million years ago, even as far back as 30 million years ago start to see inklings of it. By 20 million, we have the first genuine uh, mollusol. Um, we can see um, evidence that these particular paleosols were spreading uh, geographically. That means they must have been spreading also um, through different climate zones. This was an empire of grass, uh, like the Roman Empire, which was basically taking over the world. Um, the uh, animals, uh, not just the horses, but also bulldozer herbivores like elephants were knocking down the trees and creating grasslands where there were trees um, before um, on an unparalleled uh, scale. Um, grasslands also have low transpiration. In other words, grasses do not just uh, put water into the atmosphere. Trees do that. Trees will transpire as much water as they can possibly uh, get. If you're walking over a grassland, in, say in Kansas in the summer, um, you uh, could very easily uh, feel kind of oppressed by dehydration because the air is dry, very dry, and it's hot. There's no protection. There's no shade in a grassland. Um, if you're walking through the oak forest right nearby, um, you will feel muggy and uncomfortable because the trees are transpiring all the water that they can uh, get out of the soil and putting it into the atmosphere. Um, water itself is a greenhouse gas like CO2. 
um, this of course, um, this, the, the, the carbon that's being buried um, is of course CO2 out of the atmosphere and that has a chilling um, effect. Um, the um, H2O is also a greenhouse uh, gas, but um, unlike CO2, which hangs around in the air for generations, um, water can be episodically rained out. Um, and so in the summer in the Midwest, when you get into the forest zone, particularly around tropical forests, you have this fairly predictable afternoon thunderstorm. The water transpired by the plants in the morning uh, builds up and builds up and builds up and you get these great cumulus clouds and then eventually there's a torrential um, downpour and everything uh, goes um, and it goes out of uh, out again and the and the air clears and you have these lovely um, uh, tropical evenings. Um, there is also um, albedo, which is the reflectivity. Um, the albedo of um, a grassland um, is um, a, a, the albedo of a forest about twelve percent, uh, grassland about twenty percent. Uh, Snowfield, about 60%. Um, this is, of course, why you have to wear sunglasses when you go skiing, because uh, the sun is bouncing back off the snow um, and um, will give you really bad, uh, really bad sunburn. Um, where you have extensive snowfields, that means that heat from the sun is actually being radiated back out into space. So albedo is an important temperature control on the earth. Um, in forests, um, what happens is very little of that um, wavelength of radiation is radiated back out into space. It's absorbed by the forest and uh, keeps it warm. Uh, grasslands um, reflect that quite a bit more um, uh, and as a result have a cooling effect on the planet when the grass is green. But when the grass um, goes uh, dead, and especially when the grass is covered in snow, uh, here's the effect here. Um, in the winter, uh, grasslands covered in snow uh, will, of course, reflect 60% of the light back into space. Grass, this has another direct cooling effect. The albedo of um, the surface is cooling, um, is cooling uh, the planet. And then finally, there's chemical weathering. We've talked about this quite a bit before. Uh, let's take a feldspar plus carbonic acid uh, gives clay plus cations um, and those cations are magnesium 2 plus, calcium 2 plus, sodium plus potassium plus carbonic acid comes from CO2 in the atmosphere dissolved in water. Um, this reaction um, takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and exports it as bicarbonate to the ocean to make limestones. Um, it is also uh, diminishing the greenhouse effect on um, the earth. Um, grasslands uh, spread um, in semi-arid to subhumid regions, which turn out to be the most fertile parts of the planet, where this reaction is strongly uh, supported, um, and uh, therefore increase the rate of chemical weathering in those regions over what was there before, which was the sort of weathering that you would get in an aridosol in a drier uh, climate um, soil. So these are four ways um, in which we can explain um, global cooling uh, by the increase of grasslands. Now, um, th there are other explanations uh, for the cooling uh, that we see um, in the oxygen isotope um, record. Um, one of these um, is um, Himalayan uplift. Uh, the Himalayas were already pretty big at 20 million years ago. 
um, they started to uplift um, around about 60 million years ago. So the time is a little, a little bit off, but the idea is um, that the Himalayas um, uplifting um, would uh, create greater degree of weathering and draw down uh, carbon dioxide that way. And also they would create a big snow field in the Tibetan plateau that would uh, drive off uh, heat um, by the albedo effect. Well, both arguments are a little bit specious, actually. Um, what happens is with Himalayan weathering is that uh, it tends to uh, decrease chemical weathering. Chemical weathering is what you need. Um, what happened in the Himalayas from 60 million years ago through to the present um, is um, that you took an area that was covered in jungle and grasslands of the Tarai National Parks of Nepal and northern India and you thrust it up to the roof of the world where it's only productive in a tundra-like ecosystem or an alkaline paramo uh, for about three months of um, the year. Um, that is a net reduction in chemical weathering. What the Himalayas increased was physical weathering. But physical weathering doesn't count. Just moving stuff around like a glacier or like a bulldozer in a quarry, that does not draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and diminish the greenhouse um, effect. Um, furthermore, there's um, metamorphic decarbonation. At depth, um, we're having CO2, uh, which is actually being released by metamorphic reactions. Um, the hot springs um, and uh, carbon um, springs all around the Himalayas are uh, increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is also increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, because it's no longer sequestering it. The arrow is going um, the wrong way. Himalayan uplift was a force for warming, not a force for, uh, for cooling. Others have uh, made the point that it may have to do with isolation of Antarctica. So if we go back about 50 million years ago and look at the bottom end of the world, um, here's Antarctica, like so. Well, uh, 50 million years ago, Australia was attached to it like a limpet. Uh, and South America came off here too. Uh, Africa was already moving away. So this is Antarctica. This is uh, Australia. Uh, this is uh, South America uh, 50 million years ago. Um, that had the effect, of course, of um, deviating currents, um, warm currents, which now bathe um, the lovely beaches of Australia. Uh, from the tropics uh, all around the Antarctic coast and the coast of South America so that there were forests growing in Antarctica. Um, these uh, circulation patterns um, in um, the shores of Antarctica were such that Antarctica was kept um, as a rather uh, forested, high latitude of course, dark through a good part of the year as it is now, um, but uh, nevertheless a a forested um, area. Now, if we go through to now, uh, what's happened, of course, uh, is that um, Antarctica is still down at the bottom of the world, all right, uh, but Australia is now up here. Uh, South America is now here. Uh, Africa is somewhere uh, like this. Uh, and what has developed, it's starting around about 30 million years ago, is the circumantarctic current. which thermally isolates Antarctica and allows the ice to actually, um, to actually uh, build up. Now, um, you, this is a force for cooling in Antarctica, for sure, uh, because these ocean currents are no longer coming from the tropics and warming up the Antarctic shore. It's being isolated. It's losing heat. But does that mean it cools the whole world? Well, not really. Um, computer models readily show that the, the net budget of incoming solar radiation is the same for the whole world. Um, what this does is it takes heat away from here. It actually adds heat to these um, other regions where the grasslands are um, expanding. It does not explain the cooling that we see in a global um, level. 
uh, throughout um, the uh, tertiary. Furthermore, Antarctica, of course, has, uh, there's an albedo effect, but Antarctica is dark through most of the year. Uh, and even in the summer, the sun just sort of cruises around the horizon uh, rather low. The albedo effect has to be um, relatively uh, minor. Uh, these explanations, I think, fail um, compared uh, to the um, explanation of uh, grasslands and the invention of mollusols by the coalition of grasses and grazers as a cause uh, for uh, global um, cooling. Um, I like to think that this whole um, uh, coevolution um, effect um, is the dream of a dog. And uh, this idea um, is suggested, uh, was suggested to me by the work of Alan uh, Savory, again, uh, warden and um, grazing consultant um, from uh, Rhodesia, what was once Rhodesia is now um, Zimbabwe. Um, he has the idea uh, that um, to make the grass sweet, you have to hammer the vilt. That is an old um, boar uh, saying. That the reason why we have mollusols is because we have great herds of wildebeest in the savanna environment. Those herds of wildebeest which have cow pies, um, they uh, fertilize the landscape. Um, they are hypergrazers with really effective teeth and hard hooves that batter the grass around so that the grass is adding carbon uh, to the soil. The idea is carbon uh, has to go down into um, the soil. And this is created by herd uh, behavior. It could be that this whole mollusol thing is the dream of a dog. Um, we see in fossil dogs um, the Prorean gyrus, which is a lobe in the front of the brain, which is associated with pack hunting. And it turns up in North America around about 20 uh, million years uh, before, uh, before present. Um, once you start to get pack hunting, then you have the creatures that are um, aggregating in, um, in herds. Once you start to get herds, you start to get the grazers eating just about everything um, in sight. Uh, we start to see the first cow pies. This may seem like an unremarkable thing to you. Cow pies are created by the very loose feces of grazers, but it, it actually is a novelty that turns up around about 20 million years ago in North America. Before that, um, turds of even grazers were pellet-like, more like, uh, more like um, uh, the, um, the turds of kangaroos uh, than, the, than the turds of modern um, grazing um, animals. Um, and, uh, of course, um, with uh, these cow pies, you start to get uh, mollusol. Now, why Alan Savory is interested in this um, is that his plan um, for avoiding uh, global warming that is threatening our planet at the moment um, is a system uh, which is called cell grazing. Um, the idea is to bunch your cattle up, um, to try to mimic the conditions of the African savanna, to bunch your cattle up in the pasture so that there's just enough grass for them to survive through um, the day or the week. Don't let them sort of spread out over the paddock over a period of months where they just take the most palatable things. They eat everything. They eat it down to a nubbin and then they, uh, they poop all over it. Um, this creates a vigorous growth of only those grasses that can tolerate this degree of abuse. You have to hammer the veldt to make it sweet. Um, this creates a situation where weeds cannot gain a foothold because weeds have burrs and other toxic substances that are expensive to make. You just get the fast-growing grasses, the ones that build this mollic, uh, this mollic structure. Um, he has this, this cell grazing technique rather than just letting the cows out to pasture is of course mimicked to some extent um, with the traditional use of shepherds and dogs to keep the herds bunched together. When you keep the herds bunched together, the condition of both the crop, both the grasses and the soil um, is, is better. 
um, he's been able to demonstrate um, that um, with, with these techniques, you can build an, a weight percent of organic matter in your soil over periods of only a year or so. Uh, this is just one technique of many. There are others that include contour coppicing, um, that um, include uh, pasture cropping, uh, actually growing a crop of wheat through grass, uh, that are under the general rubric of carbon uh, farming. Carbon farming is a technique that farmers can use using these various techniques to put carbon back in the soil where it, uh, it belongs. I belong to a Facebook group called Soil for uh, Climate, which is worth following for a, a lot of this um, uh, sort of information. And uh, my group was at the Paris meeting in, 19, in 2014. Um, um, which got uh, this put on uh, the Eiffel Tower. Soil is the solution, or the solution. The solution to global warming uh, is to put the carbon back into the soil. And since we now control directly agriculture, about 25% of the world's land area, mostly in mollusols, because these are the best places to grow things, uh, both meat and vegetables, um, we need to employ these different uh, these different techniques. Australia was almost there under Julia Gillard. Um, the idea was to actually pay farmers a subsidy for the amount of carbon that they could build in their soil over um, a period of a year. Uh, and uh, the farmers could then uh, make a profitable enterprise from a very difficult enterprise as well as save the planet. Um, this is a an easy, constructive method of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and into soil. A mechanism that was solved by the great grazing ecosystems of the world that you can see in the East African game parks um, and in many of our game parks, um, like um, Yellowstone, uh, for example, um, is a very effective way of um, building soil and uh, building carbon uh, storage in, in, in soils. Um, and grasslands, of course, were uh, very important for the rise, uh, not only of our species, but of our civilization. Um, so um, that'll do it for today. Um, thanks for your attention.